Hello, and welcome to the Hopkinton Hangout Hour. HCAM News Director Tom Nappy here. And on this edition of the Hopkinton Hangout Hour, we'll start off by getting you up to date with local summer baseball happenings. In the second half hour, we'll replay our interview with local sculptor Michael Elfano. We start off with the Ashland Sevens, who got the post-77 Legion squad together and hopped on with the Massachusetts Independent Baseball League for the summer. The team has been doing a whole lot of winning and a whole lot of great hitting and a whole lot of great pitching. Here's a look at the latest highlights as the regular season came to a close. On July 30th, the 11-1 and Ashland Sevens went to Franklin to meet up with 9-3 and Franklin. Top of the second, the Sevens bats got going. Daly set to deal, and this is going to be hit up the middle past the reach of the third baseman. One run is into score. It's an RBI single for Dushney. Lawrence Tang comes around to score the first sevens run of the game. Isaac Curley up to third, Calabrese to second. Sam Farrell to the plate. Fielder steps back in. Line up and the pitch. And he'll get a piece of this. Past the dive of the third baseman. Here comes another sevens run. Calabrese being waved around. He'll score as well. And it's a 3-0 lead for the Ashland Sevens. A two RBI single for Sam Farrell. Line up and the pitch. Kavanaugh gets a good piece of this one into right field. It goes. That'll drop down. One run is in. Here comes another run to score. That'll make it a five to nothing lead. A two RBI single for Dom Kavanaugh. Mason Dushney and Sam Farrell waved around, and the Sevens continue to rally here in the second inning. Five runs scored in the inning. It was a 5-1 to one lead heading into the fourth, and the bats got going once again. 1-1 one, one pitch. That hit him, and a run will score. Tom Cavanaugh hit by a pitch. Mason Dushney comes around to score, and I don't think he minds taking one for the team in that situation, and that'll bring up Kevin Balowitz. Walk here would score yet another sevens run. Full count pitch from Trotten the Balowitz. And he will draw the walk and a run will score. Moving from first to third is James Flores and then Matt Peterson, who was the DH, takes over at first base as Lawrence Tang to the plate, and he'll get a good piece of this one into right center. That'll drop down for a hit. Here comes Horning around to score. Kavanaugh is going to be held up at third, an RBI single for Lawrence Tang. Out of Belmont Hill, the Hopkinton native driving in the eighth run of the day for the Ashland Sevens. Find the plate as he walked four hitters and hit one, and this is hit in the air by Larsh, high in the air. Over to center field, it's caught. Runner from third, Kavanaugh going to tag, and he will score. A sacrifice RBI flyout for Nick Larsh. Guzmiak set to deliver. And Calabrese makes contact up the right side, into right field it goes. Lead runner gonna be waved around, the throw is gonna be cut off. And another sevens run scores as Balowitz slides safely into home plate. It's 10 to one. A good piece of hitting there by Nick Calabrese, an RBI single. Five more runs score in the fourth and Ashland ended up taking the game via a five inning mercy by a final of 12 to one. Lawrence Tang went three for four at the plate with an RBI and two runs scored. On July 31st, the Ashland Sevens hosted Kingston. Trailing one to nothing, the Sevens bats got rolling in the bottom of the first. 
full of sevens. As Dossus gets a piece of this right side, is it gonna stay fair? Yes! And here comes a run into score. Kramer is around to score. And now Balowitz is being waved around. He will score. As Horning trots up to third, Dossus to second. It's two to one sevens. A two RBI double for Tyler Dossus. And Donovan gets a piece of this off the first baseman. Here comes Hornung around to score. It's three nothing sevens. That was a liner right at the first baseman and he could make the play. I think he'll be generous and give him a hit on that one. Three runs are in, two on base, no outs. Here in this bottom of the first. And Tang rips this one to right field. That'll drop down for a hit. Here comes Dossis around to score. Shea Donovan stopped at third, and it's four to nothing sevens. RBI single for Lawrence Tang. Bottom of the second, the Ashland Sevens played another pair of runs. Stretch. And Balowitz. Hits this one in the air over to center field. It's caught. Runner's going to tag from third and head home and score with ease. Five to one sevens. A sacrifice RBI flyout by Balowitz. Line up and the pitch. And he gets a good piece of this one over to left center to the wall. And that'll drop just in front of the wall. Hornung heading over to second base. And that's where he will stay. And that is going to be a stand-up double for Jackson Hornung. Hornung gonna try to steal home, and he will! Jackson Hornung stealing home. Makes it six to one sevens. It was an eight to six Ashland lead heading to the bottom of the sixth and the sevens added some security. And this is hit in the air right side, and that is gonna drop and be a fair ball. And Dennison is aboard with a single. Dossus do up next. Lennox deals, and this is up the left side, past the dive of the third baseman. Dennison being waved around, and he will come around to score. It's a 9-6 sevens lead. An RBI single for Jackson Hornung. Connor Kramer is half of them. He has four stolen bases. And now Hornung stealing third, and he gets there with ease. Here's number nine. For this game, it'll surprise me if the Sevens don't lead the league in steals. Will they send Horning home? He's already done it once today. Line up and the pitch. And this is hit high in the air over to center field, and it's caught. Horning gonna tag, and he will score with ease. A sacrifice RBI flyout for Tyler Dossis. The Sevens would go on to take the 10 to six win. Louis Dennison got the win on the mound while his younger brother, Andrew Dennison, collected the save. Jackson Hornung went two for three at the plate with a walk, three stolen bases, including a steal home, an RBI and three runs scored. On Sunday, August 2nd, first place 13 and 1 Ashland met up with second place 12 and 2 Medfield at Schilling Field in Medfield. The winner of this game would claim the number one spot in the playoffs. After a delayed start due to rain, the Sevens bats got rolling. This game was set for a 5 o'clock start, so a little bit late, about 10 minutes late because of thunder and lightning in the area. This is by the third baseman, a run scores, throw to first. They'll get the out, but a run does score. one nothing sevens, a sacrifice RBI ground out for Kavanaugh. Donahue set to deliver. You certainly gotta be careful where you park here at uh, Schilling Field. 
And he'll get a piece of this. Up the gap it goes into left field and another run scores. An RBI single for Dossus. Medfield responded with two runs of their own in the bottom of the first. It was a 3-3 game heading into the top of the fifth until Sam Farrell did this. Line up and the pitch. And he'll get a piece of this one over to center field. It goes to the fence and that is gone! See you later! Sam Farrell with the solo shot! And the Sevens lead it four to three. Sam Farrell going yard. That was to left center. That was hit about 355 feet by Sam Farrell, if I had a guess. Strike zone, I guess, as this is driven to center field, caught, and the throw to second, they'll double him up. How about that? Sam Palmer was cut off guard, and he thought that was gonna drop in for a hit. Started running to third, it was caught, and a great throw by Farrell to the second baseman to double him up, and we will head to the top of the six. Ashland leading Medfield four to three, you are two days. Medfield tied things up at four apiece, heading into the seventh. And the pitch. And this is ripped up the right side through the reach of the second baseman. Here comes Childs. He'll come around to score, and we're not at that four apiece. But the Sevens bats came through yet again. Line up and the pitch. Down low, runner taking off, and he'll slide into second safely. A stolen base for Farrell. The speedy Sam Farrell getting the job done. A nice steal there. Nice respect shown by Max Goodman, the second baseman, as well. Farrell a pat on the back. A lot of these players on the field right now familiar with each other from high school play. Midfield, Ashland, Allison, all in the TBL. On a new set to deliver. Midfield also has warm up action. And this is ripped up the left side. That'll get through. Farrell gonna head over to third, and that's where he'll stay, but a single for Hornung. Two on, no outs, Dom Kavanaugh to the plate. And this is hit high in the air, right side, and caught. And Farrell gonna try to tag the throw home, is not gonna be in time. Farrell scores the go-ahead run. What a slide into home plate by Sam Farrell. It's a five to four, sevens lead. Try to close it. Hornung taking off, throw to third. Not gonna get there in time. Jackson Hornung sneaking a steal through. That's his second stolen base of the day. Alowitz 0 for 3 at the plate. Takes that low. And now the runner from third gonna try to score, and he will! Jackson Hornung slides in! So Hornung scores on the wild pitch. Doss is up to second. It's a six to four sevens lead. Wind up in the pitch, up high, runner taking off, throw to third, is gonna get into left field, and now he's gonna try to come around to score, and Dossis will come around and score. Well, how about that, a big risk trying to steal third, but sometimes when you take that risk, you get an errant throw into left field, it goes off the third baseman's glove and Dossis scores the seventh run of the game for the Ashland Sevens. And this is up the middle, glove by the shortstop, throw to second, and they will get the force out and that is your ball game. The Ashland Sevens are the regular season title holders in the Massachusetts Independent Baseball League and they have clinched the first seed in the Massachusetts Independent Baseball League playoffs as they take down Medfield by a final of seven to five. The Ashland Seven scores seven runs on six hits, commit one error. Medfield five runs on 10 hits and commit two errors. And the Ashland Sevens, a tremendous victory here today, will finish regular season play with 14 wins and a loss, Medfield 
We'll finish their regular season with 12 wins and three losses. Sam Farrell collected the Andrew Sternick Award, going one for two at the plate. He was also hit twice, scored three runs, and of course had a go-ahead solo shot in the fifth inning. Tyler Dossis pitched six solid innings in the game and collected the win. Dylan Fonseca closed out the seventh for the save. The 14-1 and one Ashland Sevens next host 16th seeded Kingston at a time, date, and place to be determined in their first Massachusetts Independent Baseball League playoff matchup. So Ashland getting the 7-5 win over Medfield. Seven runs on seven hits, three errors. Medfield, five runs on nine hits, one error. It was a few hit batsmen, a few walks that led to runs, some great base running, a whole lot of steals uh, by Ashland as well on the base paths, and they took advantage of every opportunity they could get. That's what was ultimately key in this game. Some of the key players, obviously, we talked about Sam Farrell, who was the player of the game. He went one for two at the plate, scored three runs, and had an RBI. Tremendous performance by Sam Farrell, that solo shot. Uh, that was just a mo huge momentum boost for the Ashland Sevens. And then, of course, he also made some great plays in the field as well. And also, when he came flying home from third base, on that flyout, that was uh, a foul ball in foul territory uh, near first base. He came flying home, showing off the wheels, and that was a key run that was scored in the seventh inning. The go-ahead run for the Ashland Sevens. A uh, big game by Sam Farrell. And then, of course, Jackson Hornung, Mr. Reliable. He went two for three at the plate. He scored three runs in the game. Dom Cavanaugh had a big hit as well and drove in a couple of runs. Tyler Dossis was tremendous on the mound. He went one for two, uh, drew a couple walks as well, scored a run, and had an RBI. Pitching-wise, he was tremendous. He went six innings against a very good Medfield lineup. He had four runs, two of which were earned. Only two earned runs in the game against the second-best lineup in the Massachusetts Independent Baseball League. Very impressive outing by Tyler Dossis. And then Dylan Fonseca came in and got the save and allowed Ashland to capture the regular season title over Medfield. A 7-5 win for the Ashland Sevens. Taking a look at some of the season stats for the Ashland Sevens. They've had some impressive regular season stats as well. And we'll start off uh, looking at the top batting averages. How about this? Nick Calabrese, he has been tremendous. 615 batting average, 667 on base percentage. And he has driven in 11 runs, scored 14. Coach Obin left him in that ninth spot all season long, and it's paid off. They tried to move him up last year. He started struggling a little bit. He loves that ninth spot. He flourishes in it, and he's been absolutely huge in the ninth spot in the batting order for the Ashland Sevens. And then, of course, you have Jackson Hornung, who all season long has been key. A 471 batting average. He's really up that recently. 600 on base percentage. He has scored 22 runs, driven in 15. And, of course, we'll never forget that steal of home plate that he had in that game against Kingston. That was just unbelievable. And then you have Isaac Curley batting a 400 on this season, and he has scored eight runs, driven in five. Sam Farrell has been huge at the plate. 367 batting average. Look at that on-base percentage. 620. Impressive stuff. And he has scored 19 runs and driven in six. He has been absolutely huge this season. And then Tyler Dossis, not only big on the mound, but big at the plate as well. A 333 batting average, 420 on base percentage, 10 RBIs, 12 runs scored. And then, of course, Dom Cavanaugh. Can't forget about him. He has been rock solid at first base. 324 batting average, 419 on base percentage, 17 RBIs, 6 runs scored on the season for Cavanaugh. 
and then the up and coming Mason Dushman. 289 batting average, six RBIs, seven runs scored. He has been huge as well. I think Kevin Balowitz has been uh, sneaky huge as of late. 239 batting average, 315 on base percentage, 12 RBIs, and 11 runs. And look out for Shane Donovan. He is moving up in the ranks. He's gotten a lot of key hits lately. 237 batting average, 330, uh, 341 on base percentage, six RBIs, eight runs for Mr. Shade Donovan. Look at this. Overall as a team, 335 batting average. Tremendous stuff by the Ashton Sevens bats. 455 on base percentage. That is just great stats, and that's why they are the number one team in this very competitive uh, Massachusetts Independent Baseball League. Then as for pitching, Tyler Dossis, 25 and a third worked, 193 ERA, two wins on the season, no losses. And then you have Owen Radcliffe, 4 and 0 in 24 innings worked. He's been the ace of the staff, a 145 ERA for Mr. Radcliffe. And then Dylan Fonseca, 282 ERA, Two wins on the season, no losses. He's started three games, pitched four. He's been big as well. He's that third guy in the rotation. And then Louis Dennison, when they uh, have a lot of games in a week, Louis Dennison is a tremendous fourth starter. 293 ERA for Louis Dennison. Three wins, no losses, and a save on the season. And then you got guys like Matty Tomaselli, who stepped up and worked eight innings and has a save to his credit. And a 175 ERA, and we'll certainly be keeping an eye on this guy, Andrew Dennison, who worked two solid innings against Kingston the other night, a 262 ERA, and now has a save to his credit as well. So the pitching has been tremendous. And then Dom Cavanaugh, he could have a factor as well in the playoffs, especially if they have a crowded week of games. He has worked six and a third of an inning. He was a key pitcher last year on the staff, but has really been key at first base this year. Uh, but if you need a guy, you can certainly put him on the mound and expect good things. One win, no losses, and a save. Good all-around team for the Ashland Sevens. Solid stats, solid pitching, solid hitting, great fielding, great fundamentals. And that's why they are the number one team in the Massachusetts Independent Baseball League. We're certainly looking forward to the playoffs. The postseason starts Thursday night. They'll be taking on Kingston. Time is to be announced. It'll be the first against the 16th seed in the playoffs. And all 16 teams in the league make the playoffs, but it certainly favors those teams with the higher seeds. Uh, Ashland is the number one seed. Of course, Braintree ended up getting the number two seed, and Medfield will be the number three seed. It should be a very fun postseason for the Ashland Sevens. Another team we had the privilege of covering this summer was Hopkinton Senior Ruth Baseball. Coach Steve Simos, assisted by some of the Hopkinton baseball staff, brought back the program for the first time since 2015 to give the high school team an opportunity to play together since the high school season was canceled, and they have certainly made it a fun experience. In the next game for Hopkinton Senior Ruth, they went home to host Franklin, and the bats picked up right where they left off, scoreless in the bottom of the first. But that quickly changed. Victory to Framingham yesterday in a sprinkler shortened game. As this is up the left side, that's a fair ball. Here comes Rankatori over to third. Are they going to wave him around? Yes, they are. He's going to try to score, and he will. One to nothing, Hillers, an RBI double for Alex Parker Hook. Kelly will get a piece of this one. Up the middle it goes into center field. Parker Hook being waved around. Here he comes, and he will score. Two nothing, Hillers, an RBI single for Connor Kelly. And Kelly's going to get a piece of this over to first base. There it goes. And that'll drop into right field. And here comes Breslin to score. And he will score. So it looks like they flip-flop Jack Breslin and Connor Kelly in the batting order. But either way, they both get the job done. Next inning, bottom of the second, Hopkinton added 
three more runs. Line up and the pitch. That hit him, and a run will score. Danny Propura comes around to make it four to nothing. Seamus up to third, Rankin Torrey to second, Parker Hook to first, Jack Breslin to the plate. From the stretch. And this is ripped up into center field. One run is around to score. Here comes Ranka Torrey. He will score as well. Throw to third. And they will not get Barker Hook. He is ruled safe. Two more runs are plated for the Hillers. The two RBI double for Jack Breslin. And why not three more runs in the bottom of the third? Set the deal, and Ambersoni will put this up the right side. That's a fair ball. Here comes Dylan Locke to score, and right behind him is Perpura, and he will score as well. A two RBI single for Tommy Ambersoni. It is now an eight to nothing lead for the Hillers. In the stretch. And this is ripped into right field. That'll drop in for a hit. Being waved around and scoring is Amber Sony. Shane is held up at third. An RBI single for Drew Rancatori. Hopkinton would end up plating another run in the bottom of the fifth to take the 10-0 win via mercy rule and improved to eight wins, three losses, and a tie on the season. Well, that'll do it for this segment of the Hopkinton Hangout Hour. The Ashland Sevens playoffs starting soon. We're looking forward to it. Be sure to check our website, hcam.tv, as well as our Facebook and Twitter page to find out where we will be. We'll also be keeping an eye on the Hopkinton Senior Ruth team as well. We're hoping to get some guests from that team on the show very soon. So we'll certainly let you know about that. But keep an eye on our website, hcam.tv, as well as our Facebook and Twitter pages. Four upcoming broadcasts. It's playoff baseball time. It doesn't get any better than this. It's been a fun regular season, but the playoffs should be a whole lot more fun as well. Coming up next is our interview with local sculptor Michael Alfano. You are tuned in to the Hopkinton Hangout Hour. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Mom. Good to see you. My co-host is our own Tom Nappy. Hello, Tom. Hi, Jim. Hi. And welcome, Michael. Thank you for coming on our show today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All right. So where I like to start when I'm um, first interviewing somebody here is really at the beginning. So can you tell me what about you becoming an artist? When, when did you know? And um, how, did that, how did that come about? Uh, well, I actually started uh, sculpture, uh, mostly after college. I did a little bit before time, and I grew up in New York City. So I uh, studied at the Art Students League, which is a very famous school in about 57th and 7th Street, uh, where many uh, well-known artists, Norman Rockwell, Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, they all uh, got their start and learned to sculpt uh, at that institution. They uh, the wonderful thing about the Art Students League is they work with live models, basically from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, many classes, drawing, painting, sculpting. Uh, our sculpture studio is down in the basement. Wow, that's really kind of cool. Um, I'm just curious. So, so now this is this is a cliche right you always hear about people like when people say oh i'm going to be an artist their family says oh that's really nice but you know I, you need to be able to make a living too <laughs> so did you have a supportive artistic environment uh well i had a supportive uh artistic environment and family and of course my wife and family are very supportive uh, i also have a finance degree from suny albany uh, so again, I 
not so much that I was into art before that, but I uh, went to business school, got the degree, was a stockbroker for a while, and then basically decided this isn't for me and I'm going to be a sculptor full time. Right, right. Wow. Was it was it scary making that transition uh, or did you feel comfortable and you confident? Oh, absolutely. It was, it was uh, very scary. It was a tough time. Uh, again, I was working in the stock market. I ended up quitting, uh, doing a cross country, actually hitchhiking trip from basically the perimeter of the United States, about, I don't know, 10,000 miles or so. Mm -hmm. And someplace in Utah, I decided I was going to be a sculptor without really any experience or classes or any background. Uh, funny story is the only class that I dropped out of in college was actually an art class, my only art class in college. It was just uh, it was just a bunch of frat boys that were in there for an easy A. I'm like, yeah, it's not for me. Wow. Now, were you married to Linda at that time? No, uh, we didn't get married until uh, 98 or so. Okay. Uh, so that's I graduated great. That's college in 91. Uh, that's a great story, Michael. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you come from New York to live in Hopkinton? I hear that little bit of a New York accent there when you say New York. <laughs> All right, I just had to point that out. <laughs> um, well, I studied at uh, Boston University. I traveled around the world a bunch and then finally ended up at Boston University doing a sculpture program there. Um, and had my first studio at the old Danforth building Mm -hmm. in Framingham, right on Route 135, which was the uh, mill buildings. Yeah. Uh, and then looking to buy a house, we uh, lived in Framingham for a while and then came out to Hopkinton, which is, you know, beautiful area. Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I went to BU as well, so it's nice Absolutely. to see a fellow alum. Absolutely. All right. So I'm curious because I have no idea what, takes what it takes to actually make a sculpture now i see a lot of your pictures do a lot of work with like you know with bronze and um things like that and i'm i am just like curious if you can share with us any of the technique not yet talking about the concept right but just like like how do you take your vision and get it from from your mind into this large cast i believe i believe they're cast sculptures yes it is a long very long process uh some pieces some of the larger pieces have taken uh five to seven years um some of them are much quicker than that i do have i'm gonna uh screen share here okay I, yeah we would go here uh so basically i sculpt in clay make a mold and then cast into bronze and other materials uh, and so one of my newest pieces, which is a sculpture that kind of talks about our, uh, current, the pandemic and social distancing. Uh, I'm not sure if you can all see this. We can, we can, we see it. It's a mask that has yes. a face on it. Yeah. Uh, so this one is, uh, currently called life mask. It's, uh, it is my newest piece. So you're looking at the clay sculpture there. So. I, again, through various different methods, you know, come up with the idea. Mm -hmm. So this one creates a face uh, in the shape of a mask. So really talking about the humanity behind the social distancing and the mask and all of that. So you see the yeah. earliest uh, rendition of the sculpture in clay. And then we make a mold, which is sort of a, if you think of a, a jello mold. Yeah. Um, where you pour or press something into it, it takes that shape, it hardens, takes that shape, and then becomes the final product. And that could be in resin or bronze or plaster. Uh, many of your viewers may have cast in plaster or chocolate or something else of that nature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can cast in just about anything. Yeah. When I was in high school, um, the movie Conan had just come out with Arnold Schwarzenegger mm -hmm. and I uh, really, really liked his sword. So sure. in shop class, I did a, uh, a cast with uh, aluminum 
and I mm. made like the sword hilt. Oh, nice. Yeah, but I never had a blade, so it just ah. <laughs> it really wasn't that useful. Mm. Now, do you lose the clay sculpture in that process, or is that able to be preserved after you make the mold around it? Uh, well, the clay is not permanent, so there would be no reason to keep it. Um, the, I try to be as green as possible, so all of the clay is actually recycled to make a new sculpture. So oh. the clay that you see here might have been George Brown, the sculpture <laughs> on the common. It might have been, uh, you know, any number of things before this. And it's just right. amazing that, you know, all the spirit of different things that has been goes into the newest sculptures. Right. Oh, that's so interesting. And by the way, I know that at one point you were inviting people to make suggestions uh, for a name for that piece. And I just want to say Life Mask is a great name. I, I really like that. Uh, thank you. Yes. Now, do we've, you, got some, yeah. we've got some really great uh, suggestions and thoughts about the sculpture. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Is, is the clay fired or is it, does it stay kind of like wet and then you reuse it? Uh, no, it, so it's not fired. I don't use uh, uh, ceramic clay is the clay that you would think of as being fired, uh -huh. like, um, you know, ceramic mug or plates or pottery. Yeah. So uh, when you fire it, then that becomes a permanent object that can't be reused. Uh -huh. uh, this particular clay is more like a wax. And so I actually formulate my own uh, clay uh, material, the, sort of the, the chemistry composition of the clay. And so I can make it harder or softer depending on the uh, requirements that I need. And you can oh. actually heat it up, make it liquid, paint with it, pour it, do all kinds of crazy things with, with this particular clay. No kidding. That's amazing. So it is pretty amazing. Yes. All right, Tom. Uh, I was just curious. So how long does the clay last? Does it ever expire or get too hard to use or anything like that? Uh, if, if you take care of it, the clay will last forever. Uh, there's stories about uh, some of Leonardo da Vinci's clay uh, that he used being sort of passed down through the generation. So that's like, you know, five, 600 years old. So this kind of plastilina, which is an oil-based clay, can really last forever. And how much do you have? <laughs> well, I'm just wondering, like, did you have a, a George Brown statue sized piece of clay? I, yes, I do. So early in my career, I actually bought uh, 2000 pounds of clay because, you know, you could do it and it's a whole lot less expensive that way. Mm. And so I've just been recycling that clay over and over again. Uh, so when I do the big pieces, it's actually mostly not clay. So essentially what I, to get it to stand up for a big piece, uh, you make a metal armature, which is the support. And then I actually use styrofoam. If you think of your blue board home insulation type foam. Yeah. So that stuff you can cut, carve, glue together basically to make almost like a mannequin. And so I actually make, if you can think of it as a mannequin with the metal wire as the skeleton, yeah, And then I can actually uh, bend and shape uh, each of the arms, each of the limbs to, uh, again, have the exact pose that I want. Again, similar to a mannequin. And then the real art comes in when you sculpt the clay over top of that styrofoam base. Right. Um, I'm just curious. When you, so when you have a clay piece and you're putting something like resin or something surrounding it that's going to be a bronze piece, uh, what, kind of, what kind of material is used? Because it has to withstand the heat of melted bronze, right? Yes, yeah, so there's two processes, a cold cast, which is a resin, and then the bronze, the bronze is uh, poured at 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so you're correct. Uh, so you have to uh, you use what's known as the lost wax bronze casting process, which you may have heard about on PBS or some of these other historic um, shows. Uh, they've been doing uh, bronze casting for over 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very traditional. So typically when I do my pieces, we make, I make the clay sculpture 
make a mold which is a negative almost like a jello mold yeah then to do a wax to do a bronze you pour wax into that mold oh. then take that out make another a ceramic shell which is almost covers the front and the back of it melt out that wax which is the lost wax part of it yeah and then you can pour in the molten bronze at 2000 degrees fahrenheit so it's so, basically like pouring liquid lava. You know, if you think of like <laughs> seeing images yeah. of Hawaii and the lava flowing down the rocks and it's all yeah. glowing bright hot. Yeah. If you think of that being poured from a big kettle yeah. into almost like a coffee cup. So like filling okay. your coffee cup with 2000 degrees hot molten metal. Yeah. Let that cool down to block to black. So it's like a solid block of metal and then you chip away that shell or coffee cup or whatever you pour it into it yeah. and then you have a sculpture that will last thousands of years. Wow. <laughs> so so at one now. point there was a, a wax George Brown statue. Absolutely. Yes. So, but it's, it's not solid, is it? It is, is not it? solid. The uh, bronze wall is about half an inch thick or so. Okay. And with the metal, that's all you really need. Um, now that's what th this Michael is a question I've always had in my life. I understood the what you described as the lost wax process, but when you make your wax, then you put something around it and then you melt that all out. You just have a cavity that is your sculpture. When right. you pour metal into it, how do you get it? So it's just a half an inch thick and not solid. Well, again, you have a, a mold part in the front and a mold part in the back. Oh. So the part that's the wax, which is a half an inch thick, yep. is when that wax melts out, essentially you have a very thin cavity. Uh, again, like if you think of a coffee cup, yep. if you squash it together, so instead of being round, you have a very flat, thin coffee cup that's a half an inch thick, yep. and whatever length or width. Okay. And then you can pour the molten bronze into that. And okay. it's cast in many pieces. So George Brown was maybe 10 or 15 pieces. Then those all have to be welded together. Uh, we do metal chasing, which makes it all, makes all the seams invisible. Yep. Uh, sandblast, patina, and all that good stuff. Right, Box. right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. <laughs> that is enough on the technical side, because I'm really interested in what makes you tick okay uh, so w when I, I like being commissioned for a piece of work is is one thing now i know you were commissioned to make the george brown statue absolutely um when you are sitting around and you're thinking and you are coming up with a piece of art that you want to make what what motivates you what what kind of things do you do you go for with your art? What are you trying to um, to express? Sure. Well, I really try to express uh, very contemporary things that we're going through. Again, similar to the life mask sculpture. So, uh, and I try to have a, a piece that really speaks to the humanity. So, the life mask, and I'm going to screen share and go through a couple of. Um, photos here on my website. You can also see, uh, the viewers can see my work on my website, michaelalfano.com. Great. Uh, again, you see the life mask here, mm -hmm. again, really trying to capture the humanity and um, beauty of the human form behind the mask uh, and getting at what we're going through with the social distancing and the quarantine in a very somewhat light and fun way, but also somewhat serious. Uh, this is another new piece called Tangled in Truth. And so the figure, and can you see the uh, sculpture I, there? I can, tell me about that. Uh, is it coming up on your screen there or is that? Yes. Okay. okay, so you see the figure kind of lifting up a book and then the uh, pages of the book are kind of scrolling around him. Mm -hmm. kind of talking about how um, in present day 
truth has been eroded and kind of gets so uh, entangled mm-hmm. that it's very hard to find out what the actual truth is and where information came from. And so the figure, he's raising up the book, so really honoring the truth and the facts, but also with a hand kind of protecting uh, himself. Oh, from okay. it. So uh, while there's a desire for the truth, there's also a defensive mechanism that's coming in. And I think this is also a age old uh, response that we all have. Yeah. There's a wonderful quote that goes with this particular sculpture, uh, something like the truth will set you free, Mm -hmm. uh, but first it will piss you off. (laughs) Now, is that, was that Uh, your thing? That's from uh, Joe class. Okay. That's his happiness. So, Each of my sculptures has um, a quote that goes Mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I really like to have both the literary uh, philosophical thoughts to go with the sculpture as well as the image. And I actually have the sculpture behind me. I'm going to shoot around and you can actually see it in 3D here. Oh, okay. There we go. And so you can see the book, the hand being held up there. Yeah. A little bit of uh, show and tell. Oh, that's not. Now I noticed on the picture on the bottom of the scroll, there were letters. Is that your signature on the bottom uh, of the actually scroll? Actually, at the bottom of the scroll is actually the word truth. Okay. And uh, I don't know that I can get a, um, I can try to screen share again so you can get it. Um, but it says truth. And so essentially, uh, you know, as it scrolls through all of its different permutations, we hopefully get to what is the truth. Mm-hmm. And the truth can be very fluid and it can be very different for different people. Right. And this was a piece that was not commissioned. It was something that you're just expressing. That's right. Yes. So uh, many of my pieces are pieces that I do on my own. Um, again, they, you know, to try to sell them or what have you. So, uh, you know, really speaking to the contemporary thoughts and processes and things that we're going through. Right. Is that, was that, is that multiple pieces put together? Or is that one single piece? Uh, This particular one is uh, cast in one piece. Okay. Uh, The one that I was showing you is the uh, first resin Mm. sculpture. And then the, um, I'm actually casting a bronze. Oh, I see. The, the bronze is quite a bit more expensive than the resin. Uh, so, you know, many people go with the resin. It looks very similar. So mm-hmm. you can really enjoy the sculpture for a fraction of the cost. Right. So um, you were saying did, did, that some of these can take over five years uh, of your time to work on? Yes, they can be. Um, again, I'm going to screen share here and just let me know that you're uh the pictures on my the website is coming up okay so you should be seeing the website here again yes okay so this is uh, a recent piece that i did of milton and rose friedman uh milton as a uh, he passed away a number of years ago he was the nobel laureate in economics and so this is a life-size sculpture of them at their foundation headquarters up in Vermont, in uh, Fairly, Vermont. Uh, so that was this was actually uh, installed in October. We were supposed to have an unveiling this May, which has been uh, postponed until next fall. And yeah. there's actually another view, quite a um, that's really panorama. Cool. There. So this one took a bit over a year or so. So uh, similar to the George Brown sculpture. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to pull that up if the yep. viewers don't remember it. So again, there's George Brown at the on the Hopkinton Common at the start of the Boston Marathon. Yes. And uh, let's see here. Yeah. And George Brown has been saying safe behind the mask. Oh, yes. We heard this story. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that was uh, put up with a 26.2 foundation and uh, Tim Kilduff. Uh, 
So it was very that's exciting. Really, that's really cool. You know, it makes you think. Yes, definitely. And so How many of did... my other monumental pieces are in Massachusetts and uh, local areas. So this is a sculpture of the LaRusso family, which is in, uh, in Barnstable at the Historical Society. And so while they were raising money and different sort of political things going on to secure the location and whatnot, uh, this particular sculpture took about five years or so. Not mm. so much all sculpting, but also the making the maquette, getting approval, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and if you remember with the George Brown sculpture, it was actually at the um, police station for about a year before it went right. into the comic. And is the LaRusso family a functional bench? Would somebody go up and sit next to them? Yes, they can. Yes. And that, that's the fun thing about many of my sculptures. They can be functional. Uh, this is another one called Peace Offering. Again, very timely. Uh, so it is a functional bench. It's mm -hmm. about uh, six feet long and 19 inches high. So it's a comfortable height to sit on. Mm -hmm. But it features a dove and a hawk. So if you see the dove, on the right hand side of your screen yeah and the dove on the left hand side sort of towards the bottom of the sculpture so again talking about war and peace and the hope that people will sit and dialogue and where is that piece uh well the there's one here at the high school at the hopkinton high school which i yep. uh which is in the front lobby there is also one on the newbury uh, trail rail trail program Okay. I ask because I, I know that bench. Ah, uh, nice. That, uh, yeah. So I'm interested um, on the, the bottom on the right with the can that's pouring uh, the face out. This that one. one. That yes. looks intriguing to me. Yes. Tell me about that. This one is a lot of fun. It's called Poured. And so talking about uh, pouring your creativity out into the world. So you can see the uh, can of paint. Uh, kind of flowing over the face mm -hmm. and pouring your creativity out into the world. Uh, a recent series kind of talked about the act of creativity. So in the, making the sculpture, I was also featuring the creativity uh, that brings about the art. Uh, this is another similar one that's also very interesting called Stroke of Genius. Oh, wow. Uh, now, what is that material? So this one is in the resin and it's yeah. been painted. Uh, so it talks about creating your perfect masterpiece in one fell stroke. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine from the can of paint, the brush creating the uh, artwork from the can of paint to the brush in one stroke. Mm -hmm. And you know we hear stories about Beethoven writing symphonies no perfect. You know Sometimes we nail these things right on, right off the bat. And it's, yeah. you know, the artwork is done in a few hours or a night. And it's like, wow, where did that come from? <laughs> and now, who, sometimes who's, it takes many years. Who's your model for that? Uh, well, I try to, so again, the, um, like the George Brown sculptures, uh, George Brown sculpture, many of the portrait sculptures are specific people and yep. very specific models. Uh, so I did Ted Kennedy, Barack Obama, a number of other people where I really need to nail the portrait. Uh, this particular, these ones, I am trying to get more of a universal base and a universal look. I see. Uh, this is another recent one. Again, talking about our, you know, the hope for our country and yep. finding a, a good solution. So if you can see on the, you see a, a face profile. Yeah. Um, the letters on the right side of the face uh, spells the word hope. Okay. I try to keep things a little bit subliminal. So you have to, you know, there's an act of discovery. Yeah. You know, it's always nice when people see a piece of art and they have it for a month or two and they're like, oh my gosh, I never realized that spelled hope on the face, you know? <laughs> and it's like, you know, there's this real discovery. And then um, kind of the stars kind of flowing off of the flag. Yeah. And talking about unity and trying to keep, everyone together and working 
you know, sort of on the same agenda. Right. And I think that's kind of a style of yours where I see um, we have faces that are not just like a straight face, but they're, they're, they're blocks or they're different segments that come like that come together to make a face. And I think that's an interesting style. Yes. Again, you know, that that's the exciting part of it is being able to make some interesting pieces yeah. that, you know, keeps you compelled. This is another new piece. Uh, this one is called self-reflection. Again, the self-reflection that we've all had during quarantine being socially distant from everyone else. Yeah. And so you see uh, on the right side of the screen, this, this larger face, and then you can see two smaller faces on the left side, uh, one facing up, one facing down. Again, the sort of act of self-reflection. And the interesting thing is they, the two smaller faces share the chin, which is sort of the nostril of the nose. So yep. being able to use these anatomical features to create different features and blend together uh, different faces or different figures. How, how do you start that? Do you start with like <laughs> saying, I want to embody self-reflection and then do you sketch it out or do you just play around, uh, not play around, but work in clay? How do you, how do you come play, to that? Play is the right word. So okay. um, <laughs> it, again, many of my pieces, I'm thinking about it in my head. Um, again, there's, uh, I don't know, I think Bobby Orr, one of the hockey greats, uh, you know, used to talk about, he'd, you know, go to sleep thinking about how he could score a goal in a new and innovative way. He was always thinking, you know, how can I score the next goal? What kind of crazy thing can I do? Yeah. And so it really starts in the laboratory of your brain. Mm -hmm. And then at, when I go to paper and play with the clay, I'm trying to figure out how these things will, uh, you know, come to fruition in a way that uh, really speaks, is compelling, looks good. Uh, many of my sculptures don't make it out of the basement just because it's a great idea, but it just doesn't ever, you know, execute well. Yeah. And, um, and so that, you know, that's a challenge. You know, we have shows that, that go like that too. I like that, yes. <laughs> that never make it out of the basement. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, if you wouldn't mind just uh, stopping your share, we sure. have used okay. up all of our time. And I just want to tell you, it's been fascinating listening to uh, where your art comes from and some of the process behind it. And thank you so much for sharing your, your talent and your time with us. Very good. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, always a pleasure and all the best and stay healthy. All right. You too. Bye-bye.